Good morning or good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to my YouTube channel and to the third installment in the design process of this rather large and complicated multi-deck layout. As you may recall from the last two installments, it is a mushroom design where the upper deck is operated from a raised walkway. And by the end of last week's installment, we had the bottom two decks pretty much complete. Here is the lower deck, mainly a staging level, but it also has one scenic area as well. And here is the middle deck, or the main deck, where most of the trackage is owned by the Norfolk and Southern. Although if you recall, there is an interchange with two different short lines. One, a harbour belt, which just runs a short distance on this deck, and the other short line interchanging at this point and running around, gaining height all the way to the upper deck. Now currently the upper deck has not been designed in much detail at all, and that will be the subject of this week's installment. So here is the plan of the upper deck as you last saw it in the previous video. I briefly showed you this view when I was talking about the design of the end of the walkway. At the moment all I've done is blocked in this area for the short lines central yard, this side of the aisle for a minor industrial branch. Remember we're going to have a beam at this point with potentially restricted headroom for taller operators so we didn't want any major operation here it was just going to be restricted to a scenic run. And then we're going to have a pair of towns on opposite sides of the second aisle, giving us a total of four main switching areas on the upper deck. Now from fairly early on in the design, we knew that we wanted one of these towns to be a single large industry. And the two candidates for that were either a paper mill or an ethanol plant. And we decided to go with the paper mill. And it made sense to put that at the end of the line, because then the end of the aisle can be used for a junction, which is no longer in service. The original main line leads into the trees and against the backdrop, and we're assuming that this route is now abandoned. It's just kept open as far as the paper mill. There's another area here where I have a single track leading off into the backdrop, and this one, the intention is to make that a lead track for a single offstage industry. And although we still have a long way to go on all of the switching areas, the basic design of this upper deck did not change. Now in this kind of situation, I typically work on one area at a time, and I decided to start with the paper mill, because of the four areas, it is by far the most complex. Note how at the moment, the backdrop follows the fascia of the deck below. Although if you recall, that was angled forward slightly in the canary area. So the first thing I have to do is to modify that. Here is a detail of the paper mill area. This is not the first one that I drew. I had a few false starts in this area. Now typically rail serve paper mills include a small yard. And my original idea was to have that running through the middle with the various areas on both sides of it. And I was hoping to include the pulp wood and or wood chip unloading areas as well. And I was struggling to get everything to fit. That was until I decided to run the yard down the front edge of the bench work and to put all the represented areas of the mill behind it and leaving the rest of it just suggested in the aisle, although not actually modeled. A paper mill of this size would have several acres of pulp wood and wood chips stored ready for use. And although the unloading facilities can be interesting, the mountains of raw material are really not an effective use of the space. The layout of this mill indicates a history of expansion. We have the older mills at this end, power plant in the middle, and then the newer areas of the mill sprawling into the other direction towards the freeway although I did put a paper recycling plant next to the old mill, and that would probably also be a later addition, giving a local contrast of new versus old. Now, one thing that will become evident from looking at photographs of modern paper mills is that they typically have a huge array of storage tanks, as well as a maze of overhead pipes and conveyors. Now, I'm not gonna draw in that pipe maze because it would just obscure the details, but I have gone some way towards showing a lot of storage tanks distributed between the main buildings. Although I said earlier that we weren't going to model the pulpwood and wood chip piles, we can at least suggest the start of them along the fascia. There are two tracks leading off into the aisle here, although one of them is just a dummy. The client has an existing layout to dismantle, 
and we figured this would just be one of the turnouts that doesn't come up properly, permanently installed in a straight position, with the other track just being a dummy, just to give the impression that there are more tracks off stage than we modelled. This would be for the pulpwood delivery, and then another turnout further down, leading to the rotary dumper. Now really that should be further along here to allow a longer lead-in track, but there really wasn't room for it. And if we think about it, do we really want a long track running through the rotary dumper? Because although it is a convenient way of unloading the wood chip hoppers on the prototype, reliable rotary couplers may not be too feasible in HO scale. So although using a rotary dumper to empty one or two cars in operating session may be fun, rotary dumping an entire train length cut is quickly going to become repetitive and tedious. So here, just by allowing one car length beyond the rotary dumper, we have the facilities for the operator to just dump two cars and then the rest of the loads will be removed between operating sessions. And we can just assume that that was done by a different shift. Now, although the paper mill continued to change dramatically, at this point we thought we did have the basis of a promising design. So next I started working on the yard area. Here we have a drawing showing the yard filled in, although it's still fairly basic. All I've done is hooked up several parallel tracks with proper turnouts at each end. And I've used mostly number sevens with a few number eights where the alignment fitted better. And at the moment, everything is parallel to the bench work. Although it is my intention to skew it slightly, it's a lot easier to draw it in parallel and then turn it later when I know how much space I have to do so. Now you may notice that I don't have a yard lead at either end of this yard. On the middle deck, the main line Norfolk and Southern Yard, it was very important to have an adequate yard lead so that the majority of the switching can be done without fouling the main line. But here we are on a short line where there would be a very limited number of trains and the prototype probably would not go to the expense of a dedicated yard lead. And with the operating size crew that we're envisioning, there will probably only be two train crews assigned to the short line at any one time anyway. So if they're both in the yard together, one of them can switch from each end because all the tracks are double-ended. At the moment, it's eight tracks wide, although the outer two tracks have to be kept clear for thoroughfare and to gain access to the various industrial spurs. Remember, there's going to be a fairly high density of industry at this point, so that we didn't have to spend too long switching in the Norfolk and Southern area. And also, there is no designated main track through the yard. Every track has equal status, because there would never be a through train. All the trains on this line will be turns originating and terminating at this point. We'd have one local serving the short branch around the other side of the aisle. We'd have another one running to this town and one to the paper mill. And those would typically be fairly short trains. The transfer runs down to the lower deck may well be heavier and those would probably need doubling over onto two tracks on most days. You may notice that the length available for this yard is a little bit restricted. Hence the reason of wanting to add a fair number of tracks. And when I talked about this with the client, he told me to go ahead and add one more just to be safe. So that's what I did. Here we see just a little bit more detail. You may notice that I've skewed the yard slightly, so that it's not quite parallel to the fascia, and this makes it a little bit more interesting. I wasn't able to get as much twist as I wanted to. It's actually only two degrees off the parallel but that allowed me to break up the lines a little bit without running out of space. And also the types of industries have all been specified. The industries along the front are all fairly low, using nothing higher than a single story building, whereas those in the rear can be much taller. Where it is necessary to pass through the backdrop on the way up into the yard, I put a road overpass disguising where it disappears from view because it seemed to make a lot more sense than putting a tunnel this close to the yard. Also on this version I filled in the last of the switching areas and we decided to make this a very minor area with just a few industries. We have the Walters Valley Cement made larger by combining two kits, another basic placeholder next to it, and another industry leading off the front edge of the fascia. We've also decided that the one on the backdrop is going to be a chemical works. Now at this point we went back to discussing the paper mill and at the moment the backdrop is following the fascia for the lower decks. I did it that way because originally my plan was to have it slightly lower than the town on this side so that one or more of the tail tracks 
could pass under this town to give us greater storage capacity. But since the shape of the site made that impractical, there's now no reason to have it lower. And in fact, if we have the grades coming up from the central yard to this end of the line, it actually improves the walk under aspect of the bench work because this yard is pretty much at the minimum elevation for taller operators to be able to walk comfortably underneath it. So obviously the freeway underpass doesn't want to be any lower. And there's plenty of room at this end of the yard to climb out three inches or so without an excessive grade so that the freeway can be at the same elevation as the yard. So the last two towns at the end of the line can now be three or four inches higher. So with the paper mill at an elevation of around 86 inches, there is plenty of room for the deep bench work that would be necessary to brace it against the truss. So now there is no longer any need to restrict the width at this point. In theory, we could build the paper mill all the way back to the truss and do a pretty good job of it. Now it would be over five feet deep. Obviously the track would have to be constrained towards the front edge and it would be difficult to access for construction or cleaning. So we decided not to go all the way back, but to widen it to about 40 inches or so, so we could still reach across by means of a step stool for installation of the structures at the rear. Here is another close-up view of this area. It shows the realignment of the backdrop in the paper mill. And I included this view to show something else as well. Notice the angled grid where the old mills are located. It's my intention that this old mill could be constructed using DPM modular components. So of course everything needs to be a multiple of three inches. So I created a large grid of three inch squares and then I made sure that any track that needs to enter the building does so exactly in the center of the square. That way we know that everything will work out exactly when it comes time to build it. This view also illustrates another one of my little tricks for producing my drawings in Third Planet where it is necessary for an object to butt up against the fascia at an angle, it looks a bit awkward if it overhangs into the aisle. Notice these white rectangles, here for the freeway, here for the yard lead, here for a wood pile. So where objects extend into the aisle at an angle, I just draw this rectangle along the fascia and make the edge of it invisible. Now in most cases, that would be job done, because more often than not, the aisle is a white background. But in this case, I have a shaded area to represent the raised walkway. So I've still got to come back and paint these rectangles the same color as the background, and then they will disappear completely. I thought I'd just share that tip for viewers of mine that also use Third Planet. In this next view, all the upper level track has reached its final form. The paper mill has been completed. The switching town opposite has been slightly rearranged with the cement works being flipped end for end, allowing us to also switch the direction of the industry next to it. And we decided we we're gonna make it a concrete casting industry, which is gonna be a wholly owned subsidiary of the cement plant. And also this town has changed slightly. I've angled the steel company buildings to fit the same alignment as the other industries along the back, figuring that there's probably a public road serving the other side of them, so that it would make sense that they were all in the same alignment. Doing this means that there is no longer space for a team track in the middle. So I've moved it to the yard area. It's now sharing a spur with the scrap yard. Now note that this is not intended to be a steel mill by any means, it is an end user. The client wanted an industry that would receive steel in coil cars and send out fabrications, possibly to an auto plant somewhere. So that's what this building represents at this end. And the one next to it is basically a covered steel yard with the track leading sharply under it. And this was inspired by a prototype industry in Phoenix, Arizona, that was modeled in end scale a few years ago by my buddy Vinny, also known as BNSF 6951. So if you're interested, check out his video where he scratch built a model of a company called Smith Pipe and Steel. Made a very good job of it. And that was my inspiration for this industry here. So Vinny, if you're watching this, thank you very much. And for my third planet using viewers, here is the remnants of another trick that I use. Ignore the squared grid, I've already explained what that's for. It also shows two versions of the fully detailed version of the craft mill, one a mirror image of the other. And notice this piece of track sticking out the corner. That allows me to select one or both of the structures and a piece of track 
and drag them towards the appropriate spur on my design, which ensures that the structure lines up perfectly, instead of just trying to rotate it by eye. And after that, it's a simple matter to resize it as necessary and to trim it off at the backdrop. So with all the track now in its final form, let's draw in all the details. Here is the upper deck finish. If you recall, the interchange point for this short line is under this section of benchwork here. And our main line runs around the end of this aisle, all the way along the back of the room, around the end, and over the top of the door, before arriving at their yard, giving us a main line run approaching two scale miles, all of it out in the open. I've already described the railroad elements in a reasonable amount of detail, and everything is notated here, so I'll just leave you to look at it for yourself. Remember I said that the main line ramps up from 82 inches at this point to around 86 inches on the other side. Now with a 32 inch raised operating platform, the track in this area would still be at a reasonable operating height. In fact, it would be at what I would consider a more ideal height, but the client prefers to keep it at around 50 inches. So I've shown here a ramp. Since we only want to gain about four inches on the platform, a step would be more of a trip hazard than anything else. So we keep the operating platform level until we pass under the restricted headroom area. And then I've allowed four feet for a ramp, giving us a one in 12 ramp angle and keeping these two operating areas at an effective 50 inches. And the short line is assumed to follow a local freeway and cross it twice, once over and once under. At this point, I've curved the freeway around the long bend because I didn't want to go straight into the backdrop because while I wanted to be able to pass under the railroad at a reasonable angle, I didn't also want to have to cross the lead track for the chemical works. And with it hitting the backdrop at the end rather than the back, it also allows me to hide it from view with a tree line. At the end of the aisle, it's a lot easier to hide where it hits the backdrop because not only is it at a much higher elevation, closer to eye level, but it's fairly well back. And being at the end of an aisle, the viewing angle is fairly well controlled. So it's a lot easier to have the continuation of the freeway printed on the backdrop and to still look reasonable from any normal viewing angle. And the benchwork is probably just about deep enough at this point to have the freeway come over a hump and then head downhill. So it is even more obscured where it hits the backdrop. And I just realized I haven't really talked much about this town. So let me do that now. We have four major industries lined up along the back. The two at the end are rail served and the two in the middle one we're saying is no longer rail served and the other one was never rail served. On this one, the loading dock would still be present and maybe the spur. In fact, the turnout might still be in there since it's not a main line. It might just be thoroughly rusty or the track could be removed altogether, just leaving the loading dock. There's no reason why it can't still be an active industry because there's plenty of room for the turnout. But we decided we already have enough. We wanted to avoid overwhelming the length available for the run round at this town. The two industries in front. One of them is an off-stage industry, just with the lead tracks heading off into the aisle, where it's assumed that the implant switching is going to be done by a tractor. And the other one is a second propane dealer. We're assuming that this used to be a general service fuel dealer selling oil and coal. Right now we have the remnants of the coal trestle, just the masonry pier still in place. The steel trestle above would have been removed and sold for scrap long ago because it would no longer be selling coal. And also we've made it look as though the main line once continued further at this point by ending at a bridge abutment with the bridge having been removed. Now, although this is only one deck of a three deck layout, this short line by itself would actually make a very nice layout for somebody who doesn't have this kind of space, especially if the two ends of this main line here and here could possibly be connected up with each other via staging. Now this pretty much completes this layout design. I'm not quite sure what else I should really say about it, except that it has been a thoroughly interesting process from start to finish. The mushroom design making it particularly so. So let me just go back now to the lower levels. Here is the bottom deck. There were a few changes since the previous view. The post here for supporting the severed truss I decided it would make more sense to shift it slightly towards the walkway instead of leaving room for one track to pass behind it. 
this hidden main line now goes in front of it because with the alignment of this end curve, there was plenty of room for it anyway. And it gives us more room at this point. I've also added a second tall rock outcrop midway along this seam to allow us to hide a sturdy cantilever joist to support this critical location along this run. That way we now have two spans of around six or seven feet instead of one very long span. The lower deck also had a couple of minor adjustments to it. The severed spur that was in this corner has now been replaced with a TOFC or Trader on Flat Car loading ramp, which was one of the industries that the client originally asked for, but which hadn't been included on the previous version. And also I told you about last time, realigning the public road and going to an overbridge instead of a grade crossing, which improved the area available for the small town. So let's just go back to the upper deck one more time. Here is another view of it without all the annotations. Feel free to pause it if you desire. And then here is the cross-sectional view one more time. It's exactly the same view that I showed at the end of the first installment. And here it is again. So I'm going to sign off now. Hope you've enjoyed this presentation. And I hope to see you again next week. Thanks for watching and bye for now.